We're talking about conservation in the garden and taking some exciting field trips. It all starts right after this. During my years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore and create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to The Garden Home, a show about design and blurring the lines between inside and out. Now, in today's show, we're going to focus on conserving natural resources. One of the things I want to touch on is how we can make better choices. After all, that's what this whole place is about. Well, that and feeding some of the animals, and we'll get to some of these guys a little later. But seriously, it's about making better choices for the planet, greener choices. You see, I really enjoy bringing people out here to learn about organic gardening and the latest innovations in green building and being responsible landowners. Today, you'll get to meet a special guest to the Garden Home Retreat, Chuck Lavelle. Now, you've probably heard Chuck play and not even known it. Here he is performing for some school kids who visited the retreat. You see, Chuck is the keyboardist for the Rolling Stones and has worked with many other bands. And while he's certainly proud of those accomplishments, his greatest role may be as a conservationist. He's really an inspiring guy, and I can't wait for you to meet him. And speaking of inspiring, I had an opportunity to travel to Indiana where I happened upon two great stories that I want to bring to you. Now, the first you may have a little trouble believing. It's an automotive factory that's gone green. They don't produce any waste that goes into landfills, and they're preserving wildlife on their property. This is a model I think we're going to see more and more of as businesses begin adopting greener measures, or at least I hope so. We'll also visit the Future Farmers of America, an event where young people who are interested in agro-sciences are honing their skills as leaders in agriculture and horticulture. If you're like me and enjoy seeing kids succeed, then this is a great story for you and you'll want to hear it. Right now, why don't I introduce you to my friend Chuck Lavelle. Come on. You know, Chuck, when you look at some of the statistics about the future, I mean, right now we're at, well, I don't know, it's like 6.5 billion people on this planet. And by the year 2050, we're gonna be at like over 9 billion people. Absolutely, that's a lot of pressure on our natural resources all around the world. We have over 300 million people here in this country and, yeah. and we, we have to be careful about that. But you know, something that's remarkable about our forest here in America is that even with that amount of population, we have about the same amount of forest cover now as we did 100 years ago. Really? Absolutely, and that's something to be very proud of. We talk about conservation. What are we talking about? Well, we're talking about wise usage. Uh, first of all, let's realize that trees are a organic, natural, and renewable resource. Yeah. We want to use this wonderful resource, but we want to use it wisely, we want to use it carefully, and we want to use it sustainably. Yeah, you know, in this place since 1840, which is the earliest abstract, it's been cut twice. It was cut around 1900 and then 1950, and we're just gonna do the best we can to be good stewards of it for the, for the next cut because these trees are a, a renewable resource. Absolutely, and, and uh, I would compare it much like uh, weeding a garden, <laughs> Alan, you know. and Thinning out the weak. You bet. And undesirable. That's exactly right. You know, you want to leave the best uh, to grow to be strong and healthy. And, uh, you know, I think genetics play a big part of it too because when you're doing that, you're improving the genetics of your trees, just as you would be if you're improving the genetics of shrubbery or ornamentals or, or any, uh, any other vegetation. Yeah, you know, we're trying to do as many things as we can to preserve resources here, not only for the next harvest of timber, but on a daily basis. Um, one of the things I'm particularly excited about is, is the way we're trying to conserve water. We, we have these ponds yeah, here, beautiful pond. which were here, gosh, probably put in at the end of the 19th century, and they're a source of water. Um, but we're also harvesting the water off the house. We're taking all that rain water Fantastic. and uh, putting it in a big cistern and we're gonna use that for the garden. So I'm, I'm excited about that. As we move into, I'm, I'm afraid, a, a very dry phase here on the planet where water be is becoming more precious. It's so cool for me to think about you. Here's a guy who plays with Eric Clapton, the Rolling Stones, the Almond Brothers. 
who loves trees. You know, <laughs> I just think that's the greatest. Well, I appreciate that, and uh, you know, I, I'm passionate about conservation, forest, uh, and natural resources, just as I am about music, and I and I enjoy it as equally as much. Keep up the good work. Thanks. Appreciate it. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty pumped up by the way I see the green movement gaining more in momentum. And it's a really positive step, you know, when major corporations are looking for ways to reduce, reuse, and recycle. Now, I know this doesn't look like it, but this is actually part of an automotive factory's campus. This green space serves as a unique home for wildlife, while just around the corner, a busy factory is setting a standard for automakers that might seem like a tough row to hoe. You see, this is the Subaru Indiana plant, and in 2004, they became the first automotive assembly plant to be zero landfill. Becky Bright, the environmental group leader at the campus, talked with me about their green space and the wildlife it attracts. You know, Becky, it is quite extraordinary to have so much land around such a large manufacturing plant. Yeah, actually we have about 800 acres. Half of it's developed and the rest serves as part of our wildlife habitat. Really? So, so these cars that I'm seeing swirling around this large pond, this is part of the test track? Yes, it's part of our test track um, and it gets used daily during our production. So you've got half of really the property, which is wildlife habitat. And on that we have uh, five retention ponds, um, which partly serves as stormwater runoff from our buildings and parking lots, but also is, um, serves as part of the, the backyard wildlife habitat. So backyard, well this is quite a backyard. Yes, it is. <laughs> My heavens, almost 400 acres, but it is such a big facility. So on a cold and rainy day like today, the water comes off the roof of the building and the parking lots into these retention ponds. Yes, it does. And that's what brings all of these geese and ducks uh, here, yeah. Yes, um, we have geese, ducks, uh, blue heron, um, we've actually seen bald eagles, uh, red-tailed hawks, as well as other animals like coyotes and deer and squirrels, snapping turtles, <laughs> and almost any, anything you can imagine. That is really thrilling to have, have it here so close. Now the heron is sort of a symbol of this property, isn't it? Yes, and actually in the middle of this pond we have a blue heron sanctuary. Really? Mm -hmm. well, they're such majestic birds. Yes, they are. They, they almost look prehistoric or pterodactyl-like yeah. when they fly. <laughs> Amazing birds. Yeah, they are. It must be easy for you to get up every day and come to work knowing that you're making a difference in terms of the planet and doing things that make it greener. It is. It's nice. Um, nice and rewarding. I do enjoy my job. Except when it's cold outside. But it is cold. Are you ready to go inside? <laughs> yeah, but this, this has been great, but let's go back in when it's warm. All right. Well, I have to say, I'm getting very excited because each day the house begins to look more and more like a house. Today, they're finishing up some of the drywall plastering. And if you think about this house, it's really made up of a series of right angles. It's very geometric. There are very few curves. But what these master plasterers are doing is they're actually applying plaster to two curves in the house. One of them is here, which is finished and looks beautiful. And the other one is just at the head of the stairs, just under as you go into the mudroom, where the staircase meets that upper floor. And there's where they had to use some lathing, and that's what I'm holding here. Now, this is not the kind of lathing that they would have used in the 1840s, which is the model we're going after, that style of Greek revival. They would have had wood laths and strips and would have applied the plaster to that. Today, they use a metal mesh like this but everything else is essentially the same. They're applying three layers or three applications of plaster to get it down to this really beautiful finish. I can't wait to see the finished results. Just because we're still under construction hasn't gotten in the way of me enjoying the garden home retreat. I'm always looking for ways to blur the lines between inside and out. Now we don't even have our lanterns up yet on this porch, and we don't have electricity running in the building yet, but I've still found a way to create some kind of effect in the way of lighting. Look at this old chandelier. 
It's not wired at all. And what I use is candles or use it as a basket, as a centerpiece. Let me give you an idea. Back in the fall, I used this chandelier hanging from a tree. It was the perfect focal point for an autumn al fresco dinner. I filled the center of it with all kinds of pumpkins and gourds and twigs. It really set a festive mood. Everybody loved it. What we created with just a few elements was an outdoor dining room. And then in the spring, I went into the summer kitchen and I used this as really a floral display. I took the glass globes and rather than put candles in them, I filled them with water and then packed them full of perestroika tulips. They looked like big flames and they reflected the flames in the fireplace on that cold spring day. As you can see, there are lots of creative ways you can blur the lines between inside and out, bringing some things inside and taking some out. It's a lot of fun. <music> One of the things I enjoy the most about my garden is finally getting out here and harvesting some things and enjoying the beauty as well. This year, the plants that we grew from seed have done so well. If you just take the flowers over here in the cool border, the larkspur, the bachelor buttons, and the poppies have been outstanding. And here in this bed alone, you can see a beautiful row of onions. Just look at these beets. Isn't that a gorgeous color with the leaf? And then these carrots. This is a variety called Toro. And I really like it. I love to grill these and they're so sweet. I planted these back in the very early spring, back in March, and I spaced the seed about two inches apart and only covered them with about a quarter inch of soil. And if you plant several rows of them, you'll wanna space those rows about 15 inches apart. Now, one of the things you wanna remember about carrots, when you get ready to harvest them like I'm doing today, you wanna to make sure that there's moisture in the soil. They come out so much easier, otherwise they'll break right at the top like that as you try to pull them. The other thing to remember is that carrots are a root vegetable and to have this really long, beautiful carrot, you wanna make sure that the soil is deep and loose. And out here, we've really worked these raised beds up the way that those roots can really penetrate the soil and grow to their fullest potential. Even though we're still in the throes of construction of the garden home retreat, the garden, as you see, is really coming together. We wasted no time in getting the garden established first. Don't you like those priorities, the garden before the house? Now we're in peak daylily season and I thought this would be a great time to show you some of my daylilies. Yes, these are daylilies that I've been crossbreeding for the last three or four years. What I have here is the third generation of daylilies in full bloom and now I'll begin to pick out the ones that I wanna breed from from here. Now let me tell you the characteristics I'm looking for. I'm looking for a really tall daylily. I'm looking for one that's got a buttery yellow color to it a smaller bloom that is fragrant. So if you look across these daylilies, you'll see that every one of them is an individual. Some have touches of mauve, others are the color of cantaloupe, some are lemon yellow, and some are short and some are tall. You get the idea. Now let's talk a little bit about the breeding line that I went through here and the parentage of these plants. I started in the beginning with the first generation by crossing a white daylily, or almost white, called Joan Senior, with one called Hyperion. Hyperion's been around for a long time and it's very fragrant. So there's where the fragrance comes in, the color from Joan Senior. Then I took the children of that cross and I crossed them with Autumn Minaret, which is a very tall daylily. I've had them get up to seven feet tall and it blooms late. So now these are the crosses with Autumn Minaret. So now what I wanna do is try to choose an almost five foot butter yellow fragrant daylily. Now the reason these are called daylilies is that the blooms open only for one day. So as you can see here, this one opened this morning and it will fade like this one did yesterday. So that one's closed up. Day before yesterday, here's the bloom and once this fades, it will leave a tiny little seed pod like this. From those seed, I've created all these different hybrids. If you've never grown daylilies, you really ought to give them a try. They're one of the easiest full sun perennials and they're a great joy to have in the garden.
Now, during my visit to FFA in Indianapolis, I had a chance to stop by and visit one of the equestrian events. Danielle Jones, an FFA teacher, told me a little about the event going on in the arena and about her school's FFA program. Well, what do you like the most about being an ag teacher? Uh, the interaction with the students. I have a lot of fun. They keep me young and they keep me... <laughs> <laughs> on your toes. <laughs> keep me on my toes, yes. And, and they're just, they're a lot of fun. And uh, it's really nice to see how they develop from freshmen to seniors and see them go on and, and to see them later in life and, and to see the whole journey. It's, it's a lot. It's very neat. You're here with your FFA group or mm -hmm. your team. Yes. And so what is your competition or what are you guys here about? We are here for two competitions, the horse judging and the uh, livestock evaluation as well. The horse team is here today participating in this activity where they're actually participating as the judge and as the performer are performing with their horses, the students are actually the ones that are placing the classes as if they were the real judge. Fantastic. Well, you know, I think we all, or I'm guilty of this, that, you know, I thought for years FFA was, you know, a group of kids that showed cows because my cousins were in FFA. Sure. I was a 4-H'er, but didn't, didn't go up into uh, FFA later on. And, but it's really much more diverse than that. It is. They cover all aspects of agriculture, marketing, um, business, and the farm itself, and anything in between. And um, it really gives the kids a lot of information for their future, um, self-esteem team, leadership, and um, being able to speak in front of people. Um, it prepares them for any aspect of what they'll en encounter as adults. Yeah, those life skills are so important, aren't they? They are, they are, they really are. What, what is it about working with animals or the earth that you think really helps prepare someone for the journey ahead. Well, they get a sense of where everything comes from, that it's, you know, what they see in the grocery store is not where things come from. <laughs> right. And so it kind of gives them an idea and it, the process behind everything and how many people are involved at the end product. By the time they get the products in the store, you know, they get to see the behind the scenes and they get, they have more of appreciation of where things come from. Is, is it a part of the future planning of Future Farmers of America to bring more urban schools into the fold where students such as yourself mm -hmm. might have a chance to embrace some sort of career in agriculture? Oh, sure. I mean, just because you don't know anything about farm animals doesn't mean you, there's not a place for you in the FFA and in agriculture in general. Around feeding time, these guys get really excited. This is Atticus. He's a Belgian draft horse. and. Over there's his mom, her name is Kit. Atticus is just about two years old, and he's a big boy. These are permanent fixtures out here at the Garden Home Retreat. Now, what we try to do out here is keep poultry, livestock, whether it's sheep or these horses, that have some sort of heritage or lineage that could be possibly lost. Many of these farm animals are now threatened because people don't need them anymore. That's certainly the case with draft horses like these. These are called Belgians, and they became popular in this country at the end of the 19th century and the early days of the 20th century. They caught on after the World's Fair of 1903, and throughout the early part of the 20th century, uh, they grew in popularity. But by the end of the Second World War, well, we'd moved from using draft animals to mechanization, so they were replaced by tractors. Now, you can see they really love to chow down on this feed. We give them a blend of a high-protein feed that's got oats, a little bit of molasses in it. It's really sweet, and you can see they enjoy it. It's like a really great breakfast cereal. And they get lots of fresh water and green grass to eat on during the day. They each get about, oh, a half a gallon of feed this time of year per day, and they're fed at the end of the day. So they're just big, giant pets that we enjoy having out here at the Garden Home Retreat. I really enjoy design, so I particularly enjoy this particular part of the show where we take photographs that you send in of your property and we look at ways that we can improve the landscaping. Now today, we have a viewer from Salinas, California named Karen sending in a photograph of her house and what Karen would really like is color and low maintenance. I think those are two great objectives to try to achieve and let's see what we can come up with. Karen, what I like about your house is that it has a neutral color so it's a great background for any color theme 
and you've got a red colored door. So what I'm thinking is let's play with whites and pinks for your color theme and hopefully that will be something that you'll enjoy. Now I think you've got an opportunity here to maybe create an entry here with a fence that might run across here. This could be just a low picket fence that would run to the corner. So this would be pickets all along like this. You would keep, you could put a gate here because you have your path. I would create a larger little stone pad here. This could be a charming gate and wooden picket. And then what you might do along this edge to give yourself some room to get out of the car is plant this in lavender. That's a really easy perennial for you to grow there in Salinas. And then on this fence, what if we grew uh, New Dawn or White Dawn if you wanted to go with a white theme? Now, let's move from this hardscape, this idea of a fence going here, and I take the corner, Karen, and go across the front of the house, put a gate at the entrance, and then go right on over to the other property line. Now, I want to point out this. We've got an eyesore here. We want to try to block this. So let me come up with a couple of ideas there for you for that. Let's just erase this. I think screening is so important. And what we can do there is simply do a hedge planting that would come across like this. And what I would suggest is something that does very well in your area, oleander. You could go with a pink oleander, gorgeous flowers throughout the entire growing season, or you could go with a white variety. And then in the front, what I would do is use a low evergreen hedge or planting and make it all the same across there. You mentioned you had trouble with azaleas and camellias. Why don't you try Escalonia, which blooms pink, or you might even go with an Indian hawthorn. And then on either side, you can do so well with those gorgeous tree ferns. Do a pair of tree ferns on each side. And what an opportunity you have, Karen, to do a container here and a container here on either side. And if we go with this pink theme, try that Vista Bubblegum Pink Petunia. It's a knockout. And you can just imagine those spilling over here and you get that good morning sun, which will be perfect for them. So we've got our fence, we've got our roses, we've got lavender, we've got colorful shrubs here and here, which will be perennial. And then you might even accent this entry point here and maybe in front of the tree ferns with agapanthus. It's a great perennial for you. I love the big giant blue flowers. In this case, if you want to go with the white and pink, you just might choose the white agapanthus. Anyway, those are some ideas and I hope they're helpful to you, Karen. Good luck with your project. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. We've certainly run the gamut from a rock and roll great who has a conservation message to an automotive plant who's certainly doing some inspiring things to be a greener steward. Hope you've been inspired to think a little greener from today's show. Until next time, from the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at plnsmith.com.